These last few nights have been, to put it lightly, troubling. About a week ago, I planned on driving down to Southern California from Washington, you know, to get some sun. Washington is beautiful during the late summer, and that's why I'll never leave. But I'll be damned if the Washington winters don't have the most hope-sucking weather imaginable. Eh, <sighs> call me a snowbird. But my skin was turning as pale and grey as the blankets of clouds above me. And I needed out. Of course, I had my college classes to worry about. But I just couldn't even stomach the idea of showing up to a lecture with the dread that this season filled me with. I knew I'd miss some important class time. But... Missing a week and a half for my mental health was better than rotting in class. I didn't have much money for hotels, but I did have plenty of friends with vacant couches along my route. The way I planned it, the drive would take three days. The first day would be Seattle to Oregon, Oregon to Northern California, and then to the south. It was a good plan, and anybody else would say the same. But no one out there could have predicted what would soon unfold. The first stop on my trip was my friend Jules' house. Jules lived in a town called Grants Pass. It's nestled in the mountains at the bottom of Oregon. I had only been there one other time passing through, but I knew the mountain air would be nice, even if it was just as grey as Seattle. Funnily enough, Jules was the only one who inspired me to take this trip. A few days before leaving, she called me to tell her that her parents weren't home and that it was just her and her dog. At the time, I didn't know what to make of this, but when I suggested visiting her on my way down to Kelly, she seemed strangely excited. She kept thanking me under her breath and she seemed to have this slight wobble in her voice. I told her that I should be the one thanking her for giving me a place to stay. Then I kind of picked on her a bit for sounding like she was trying not to wake her parents up, even though she was home alone. Normally, this would have gotten a laugh out of her, but this time, Jules didn't say nothing. That's when I began to notice that I couldn't hear a TV or radio or anything else playing in the house. It was just silence in there. I then asked if she was still there and she told me she had to go and that she would see me soon. Then she simply hung up the phone. I thought that was a bit out of character, but I didn't think much of it because I hadn't exactly felt like myself these past couple of weeks either. At around 9 o'clock, I left Seattle for Jules' place. I guessed I would make it there before dinner. I was almost right. I hadn't anticipated the lunch rush in Portland, but I still made it to Grant's Pass at around twilight. I had to drive down this back road, away from the town centre for a few miles until I got to Jules. I pulled into her driveway, and I began unloading my trunk. After pulling out my suitcase and my overnight bag, I stopped a minute to look around. The sky was this bright pink. I could still see the lights from the town and the sky below it. Jules' house sat on this open field. It was about two or three acres in size, 
with a dense tree-like surrounding. I took a deep breath of fresh, mountain air, and I felt like new life was entering my body. My shoulders slouched back down, and the tension left my forehead. I'd become so relaxed there that I didn't even notice that Jules had not come outside. Again, I rationalized this to her just being distracted, so I walked up and rang the doorbell. She swung the door open before I could even get my finger off the button. I got the feeling that she had been standing behind the door just watching me. Despite not wanting to step outside, Jules did seem happy to see me. She hugged me, and her eyes looked excited, yet tired. We exchanged greetings, still using that almost whisper, whilst her dog Roscoe wagged his tail at our feet. I took my bags in, and I noticed that, despite the beautiful sunset, all of her curtains were closed tight. I asked her if she had a spare bedroom I could keep my stuff in, but she said I could sleep in her room. I was a bit confused by this. I didn't know if I wanted it to go where I thought it was going, but she seemed to insist, so I gave in. She asked if I wanted something to eat, using a more normal volume now. I told her I was full from eating along the way. I suggested that maybe we should watch a movie that night, and she agreed. But she just told me that she didn't want the movie too loud because it would hurt Roscoe's ears. I thought this was an odd thing to say, but since she had seemed to warm up a little bit since I got here, I didn't question it any further. We sat down on her couch around nine o'clock to start the movie. We both had laid under the blankets while Roscoe lay between us. The movie was some sort of really cheesy comedy that Jules picked out. I had a hard time sitting through it, if I'm being honest. About 30 minutes into the movie, my attention begins to wander. I look past Jules and towards her living room window. The curtains were still fully closed, but I thought I could hear something. Roscoe had perked up, and he seemed to be listening with me. It sounded like several yipping-type sounds coming from her backyard. I looked at Jules and she was still focused on the movie. I grabbed the remote and I pressed mute. The sounds from the backyard became much clearer and it sounded similar to a pack of coyotes sounding off. Jules' eyes widened and she bit her lips. She turned to me and there was an ever slight look of concern in her eyes. It's just coyotes, she said now, staring at the ground. I had not always lived in the city, so I knew the sound of coyotes when I heard them, and something just didn't feel right. I thought that there was a bit of garble in their yips, like these coyotes had pneumonia or something. I decided that I was going to open the back door and get a better look for myself. I sat up, but Jules grabbed my arm before I could do so. It's just coyotes, she repeated, this time looking me dead in the eye. Jules' eyes began to sparkle, and I sat back down. I decided that it wasn't worth it because the coyotes seemed to be upsetting her. 
at the time. I left it at that. She unmuted the movie, and we finished it without another word. She turned the TV off, and the yipping was clearly louder now than it had been before. Jules and I washed up, and we got ready for bed. She had set up a mattress on the floor of her room for me. After this coyote thing and her reaction, I began to understand why she wanted me to sleep in her room. Little Roscoe trotted behind Jules as she entered the bedroom. I had already climbed into my makeshift bed since I had a busy day. Jules and Roscoe got into her bed and we all got ready to sleep. As I drifted off to sleep, I could still hear the coyotes outside. They were much louder than I could tolerate, so I lay awake. I turned my head to Jules, and she was looking at me. How long has it been like this? I asked. Jules looked away from me and stared back up at the ceiling. She was silent for a moment before answering. Well, there's always been coyotes, but they changed only a few days ago. It was after my parents left, she replied. It's best to get some sleep while you can. I thought that was a bit overdramatic, but I decided to just try to go to sleep. After a while, the fatigue was too much and I drifted off. At this point, I doubt even a freight train could keep me from a good night's rest. Too bad it wasn't a freight train. It was around 1am when I was awoken by grinding noises. I looked over to see Jules already awake and holding Roscoe's muzzle close to keep him from barking. I began to ask what was going on, but she put a finger to her lips sternly. Even though she seemed panicky, there was this aura of confidence to her, like this was just a part of her routine. Her head was practically on a swivel as the scraping continued, getting closer to her room. I didn't know whether to duck under the covers or get up and grab something. For my ego's sake, I luckily chose the latter. I quietly got up and I fumbled through my bag. Under my deodorant, I could feel the cold metal. It was my knife that I had brought along for the road. It was just a multi-tool, but it would do. I stuck my nail in the slot, and I tried to get the stiff knife open. The blade was only the length of my pinky, and whatever was outside sounded big. I looked over to Jules as she motioned her head towards her pillow. I reached over, and I found a large chef's knife tucked away. I quickly thanked whatever deities may be listening, and I wielded this knife instead. The garbled yips became much louder, as it seemed like more approached. Soon, I could even hear claws scratching just outside Jules' window. My knuckles were practically beginning to turn white as I clenched the knife and Roscoe had stopped trying to bark. He'd moved under the bed. Soon, I started to crash from all the adrenaline. I began to nod off. But I was quickly awoken by a new noise. It was a low thud and it was coming from the living room. Then... I remembered Jules' glass back door and that these things had found their way in. 
They kept on thudding and thudding against the glass until we thought that they were almost going to get in. We heard the first crack and we knew that with a couple of more good slams, they would be inside. Jules and I then braced ourselves for a fight that neither of us was prepared for. But then came a more familiar noise. The thump, thump, thump of a helicopter came over Jules' house. Then a light, so bright it shone through Jules' curtains and filled the room. Those things outside sounded like they were going mad. They began to yip more intensely than they had before, like they were in danger. It was hard to hear over the thumping helicopter, but their sounds, they grew more distant, as did the chopper. All we could hear was the faint sound of the helicopter flying off into the mountains. And then, it was all silent again. The knife fell from my limp grasp and it popped the air mattress I was on. I was slowly lowered to the ground and sat for a moment, trying to process everything that had just happened. Did this happen last night as well? I asked. No, Jules replied in between breaths. No scratches, no helicopter, she gasped out. She laid back down, and so did I. I felt her hard floor beneath my shaking body. I asked her if maybe I could just sleep on the other side of the bed, and she agreed. Jules, Roscoe and I all fell asleep in her bed. I was still on the edge, but my intuition knew they weren't coming back. Before my mind could fully understand what had happened, I drifted off to sleep. All of us woke up late the next morning. Jules and Roscoe got up before I did. Despite Jules' fear of stepping out of the house, she had to let Roscoe out to the potty. I got up and followed her to the back door. The door's glass had a spiderweb type crack at about waist height and a single large fissure that extended from the top to bottom. I walked through the door and met Jules on the back porch. The cold mountain morning air hit my tired lungs like a punch. I felt the crunch of glass under my slippers as I stepped out and saw Jules standing with the knife, just watching the trees. I greeted her, and she jumped back a bit as she turned to me. I watched the tree line as Roscoe ran around and, eventually, turned my attention to him. He had already gone, and was now just sniffing around. Jules was too focused on the tree lines to notice Roscoe sniffing around the sides of the house. I stepped down from the porch to get a better look at what had gotten his attention, and I saw the marks. The sides of Jules' house looked like it had been torn to bits. Ripped shingles were scattered over the grass and I could see droplets of blood around as well. Roscoe had stopped to sniff at a hole in the ground. I walked over to check it out, and I saw the footprints. It looked like what I think a coyote print looks like, just much larger and longer. We came back into the house, and I went in to pack my bags. Jules urged me not to go, but I had already planned to leave that morning, regardless of the horrors we had endured. 
She begged me not to go, but I needed to get out of there. I couldn't stand the guilt of leaving her alone again here, so I offered to take her along with me. She hesitated to leave her house abandoned, but knew that that house wasn't safe anymore if the same thing happened again. So she packed a bag for her and Roscoe, and we were ready to head out the door. My hand reached for the doorknob, and I froze. Through the door's small window, I noticed the silhouette of a head, a head and shoulders, standing on the landing. Roscoe started barking for the first time since I got here, and I looked through the peephole in the door. It was a man. He was standing there and looking down at his watch. The man was wearing a spotless forest service uniform with creases that still looked fresh. I almost thought I saw a tag poking out the top of his collar. On his hip had a standard walkie-talkie, but had one of those wire earpieces in along with the standard flashlight and sidearm. I stared at the gun, trying to remember the last time I saw a US Forest Service agent with a firearm. The man looked up from his watch, and rather than ringing, he stared right at the peephole. I began to get lost in the man's eyes, and I was only snapped out of it by the clicking of the door latch. During that time, I had unknowingly turned the knob and opened the door a crack. It was too late now. I had to commit. He knew we were there. Roscoe stopped barking and hid behind Jules. I opened the door fully to confront the man. Nervously, I looked down and I saw the man's clean and shiny jack boots. I looked back up to meet the man's gaze and he spoke. Morning, sorry to bother you, the man said flatly, almost rehearsed. Uh, good morning, I choked out. Can we help you, sir? Anything out of the ordinary happened last night? He asked. Well, just some loud coyotes, I answered. My eyes moved towards the front yard. I saw the man's black SUV in the driveway. The grass had deep chunks taken out and more muddy tracks. Debris from the side of the house was scattered on the lawn. As I looked at the wreckage, the man looked back as well. He quickly turned back to me. Just coyotes, he said. Yeah, I answered with a nod. Anything else? Nope. Actually, we were all just about to leave for the weekend. You do that, the man said, with the smallest smirk. Then, back to blank. He then turned and he walked back to his SUV. He climbed into the passenger side and the SUV rolled back down the driveway. But once it pulled out onto the road, it drove for a moment before parking on the shoulder, still within our view. I took this as our cue and we loaded our luggage into my car. I pulled out of Jules' driveway, and I had to reluctantly drive past the SUV. When we pulled past, I looked into the windows. They were as black as the SUV, but I could still barely see inside if I looked closely. It may have been just dark, but I'm pretty sure I did not see anyone inside. We went on past and continued down the road into town. 
After that, we continued my trip as planned. We didn't talk much about anything during the drive. The following nights were not easy. Both me and Jules tried melatonin, but it was no use. Each night, as I began to enter the state between being awake and asleep, I would hear those noises. Eventually, Jules tried some cold medicine to go to sleep. It seemed to work for her, but I couldn't take it since I needed to drive. I was in a state through most of the trip. When I was asleep, I feared what they would have done. And when I was awake, I feared what they may have been. I almost forgot what it was like to sleep peacefully. Sometimes, when we would go out to eat, I would forget about it all for a moment. But it always came back. Jules is asleep right now with Roscoe. I'm hidden under a blanket next to them, typing this up. It's even harder to sleep right now than it has been before. My fingers are trembling. I have this tight feeling in my chest. We are on the last leg of our journey, and I have to take Jules home tomorrow. But I can't stop thinking about what may be waiting for us there. How well do you pay attention to your list of recently opened documents? Last night, when tracking down a file I had worked on, I caught sight of an unfamiliar file name on the list. Ryansjournal.doc Privacy be damned, I read it. I wish I hadn't. A whole day has gone by and I can't shake the goosebumps. The content was disturbing, to say the least. Take a look. Entry 1. July 2nd, 2014. My name is Ryan, and I'm 11 years old. I'm writing this journal for a time capsule I'm burying. Hi, older me. Hope you made it as a firefighter. Me and my mum moved this week. There's a lot of boxes everywhere. I don't like it here. It's really small. I miss my big backyard with the pool and all the oak trees. I used to climb up them and pretend I was king of the forest. There are no trees here. Just a fence and a bit of grass. I hate it. I don't know anyone here. The worst is that it's really creepy at night. The shadows in my room look like they're going to reach out and grab me. I'm too old for a nightlight, so I snuck a flashlight under my pillow so mum won't ask questions. My intention in moving was simple. Shorten my commute to work and lower my bills. I was wasting so much money heating up an entire house. When a two-bedroom apartment did the job just fine, I took it. The apartment is in the basement, so it requires less AC in the summer and less heating in the winter. As an added bonus, the place is pitch black at night. The master bedroom in my old house overlooked a street lamp Not even the blackest of curtains could keep the light from shining in. And, as a result, I had trouble falling asleep. I sleep like a baby in this apartment. Entry 2. July 16th, 
2014. Mum finished unpacking. She must have forgotten a few boxes because I don't have any toys to play with. I still don't have any friends because Mum won't let me go to the park. She said I'll make new friends when school starts. I think she's just too lazy to show me the way to the park. This sucks. I hate it here. I hate her. And she's the worst. I wish I had someone to talk to. I want to go home. Every night, the shadows get closer and closer to my bed and I scare them away with the flashlight. But I'm afraid that the batteries will die. Entry 3. July 30th, 2014. Today, I made a new friend. His name is Deacon, and he lives in my closet behind a super secret door. One I'm not supposed to tell mum about. He's really fun. His favourite colour's green, just like me. I hope me and Deacon will be friends forever. He likes all the same food as me and plays all the same games. He's older and a bit scary looking. But I don't mind. He's fun. He even told me that he could protect me from the shadows at night. Entry 4 August 13th, 2014 I asked mum if Deacon could have supper with us tonight, but she just ignored me. She was on her computer again, looking at weird symbols all evening. I grabbed an extra plate of food after supper and I took it up to my room for Deacon. He loved the ground beef, but he didn't touch the peas. I can't blame him. Peas are gross. I work as a web developer at a university. August is our busiest time of the year. It's not unusual for me to have to do a bit of overtime in the weeks leading up to the start of the fall semester. I suppose HTML code can look a lot like weird symbols to the untrained eye. I can read HTML like you would read a book. It's like my mind automatically renders tags into their intended format. I suppose to others it must be as foreign as sheet music is to me. I do not understand it at all and all I see are a bunch of dots on a half a dozen lines. Entry 5 August 27th 2014. Mum still won't let me invite Deacon for supper, so I have to sneak food to him every night. She keeps telling me Deacon isn't real. She says I'm too old to have an imaginary friend. I told her to go suck a turdsticle. She didn't like that. I was sent to my room. Grr. I hate her. Deacon is real. He's my best friend. He even crawls into bed with me at night to protect me from the scary shadows in the room. He holds me so tight that I can't move sometimes. He says, as long as we're together, we're safe. I believe him. I see the shadows scurrying away and up the wall whenever he crawls over. Entry 6, September 24th, 2014. Sorry I didn't write for a while. I started school and I had so much homework. Mum won't let me on the computer unless I'm done. Fifth graders get a lot of homework. By the time I'm done, Mum's on her stupid websites and she won't let me have my turn. Why can't we have two computers, like a normal family? At least I have Deacon to talk to. Mum doesn't like it when she hears us talk. She says it's not healthy to talk to myself. She's a triple stupid dumb shake with a cherry on top. If she'd just let him eat with us, she'd see he's real. 
a crudely drawn MS Paint doodle was included with this entry. On it, I can make out Ryan, with a tall, dark figure looming over him, holding onto his shoulders. The man has long, claw-like fingers, big dark holes for eyes, and a large, gaping smiling mouth with sharp fangs. He seems to be looking at my cat, who is cowering in the corner of the room. Entry 7, October 8th, 2014. Deacon isn't happy. Mum found his hiding spot. She got rid of all his stuff. He's hiding in the ceiling now. There's a little crawl space where the air conditioner goes. He's in there right now. I can hear him growling. He's so upset. Mum needs to apologise if she knows what's good for her. I did find a small door in the walk-in closet. I opened it and I got a face full of dust. There were a few boxes of trinkets, which I assumed belonged to the apartment's previous owners. I tossed them out. Who needs old rags, magazines and worn shoes? I found the small storage space after hearing skittering noises in the walls. I wasn't sure if mice had gotten in or if the apartment was crackling from the cold outside. I never dreamed I would find the perfect place to store winter apparel. I cleaned it up and filled it with coats and boots. Entry 8, October 22nd, 2014. Deacon couldn't come out and protect me last night because mum left my bedroom door open. He said he doesn't want her to see us together. She might make him go away if she saw him in the shadows. I was so scared, I cried myself to sleep. I needed Deacon to protect me. I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw the shadows crawling towards me. They lifted from the floor, and they made squishy noises, like they were made of slime or putty. I screamed for my mum, but she didn't come. One of the shadows got on the bed, and I felt it crawling towards me. I threw my flashlight at it. It must have landed on the switch because it lit up, and the shadow disappeared under the bed. I remember keeping the door open because my room smelled awful and desperately needed to be aired out. I always keep the door shut, so at least one room is devoid of cat fur. I would have opened the window instead of the door, but it's been stuck since the move. No amount of force has managed to pry it loose. I had no choice but to leave the door open all day and overnight. I was pleasantly surprised that the cat did not even try to step foot inside. Entry 9, November 5th, 2014. Mum has been keeping my door open. Deacon is getting really angry with her. He says he's going to have to deal with her soon. I warned her Deacon was getting mad, but she's still insisting Deacon isn't real. Stupid, stupid, stupid head. Deacon is watching. That entry is the last one in the journal. If that wasn't creepy enough, here's the really weird thing. I'm single, and I live alone with my cat. I do not, nor have I ever, had a child. I don't know what to say. Maybe it's a bad prank. But I checked the file properties and it was created in July and last updated on November 5th. I've not had house guests since late October. 
My computer is not synced up to any device, nor does it have the capability to do so. I notice the entries are typically written every other Wednesday, so I'm curious to see if there will be a new one tomorrow. If there is, I'll give you guys an update. Update November 19th, 2014 I barely slept last night. I decided to check the journal before I went to work. I don't even know what to say. To say that I am horrified is putting it lightly. This is the entry. Entry 10 November 19th Deacon is real and he's coming for you. Deacon is real and he's coming for you. Deacon is real and he's coming for you. Unless the shadows get you first. I think I'm going to stay at a motel tonight. Update. November 24th, 2014. I just wanted to give you guys an update. I think I'm freaking myself out over nothing. Ever since I found that journal, I keep on seeing things moving around in the dead of night. Around 3am this morning, I got up to use the restroom and I saw my cat standing in the kitchen. He walked towards his food bowl and I heard a familiar crunching sound. I left him alone and I went back to bed. As I slipped under the covers, my foot grazed my cat's head and he gave me an insulted, half-asleep meow. There's no way he ran past me from the kitchen into my room. The hallway is too narrow. I would have seen or felt him. I was probably just sleep deprived I guess. While driving down the road one night, I was hit with a foul odour. It seemed to be coming from everywhere. It evoked memories of driving past a hog farm. Even still, this noxious odour was so putrid that I was on the verge of violently vomiting out my own internal organs. I lit up a cigarette in a futile attempt to mask the smell but, for some reason, the scent of burning menthol tobacco only made it worse. I pressed a little harder on the accelerator in a pathetic attempt to outrun the miasma that was surrounding me. Moments later, I lost two tyres to a piece of scrap metal in the middle of the road. With my front two tyres shredding, I didn't steer so much as I slid to the scene of the crash. Of all the places on the two-lane road that I could have crashed, I ended up wrapping the front of my 99 Ford Taurus around a concrete guardrail. The seatbelt saved me from slamming into the steering column, but it still cut into my flesh. Ah, the stinging pain. The sight of windshield glass flying forward was enough to distract me from that god-awful smell. Even as time slowed to a crawl, and the contents of my otherwise cluttered back seat flew towards the front, I couldn't help but wretch as the smell overpowered and assaulted my nose through the gaping hole in the windshield that had been my only protection from the unholy fumes. It was February. If I had to guess, it was around 10 degrees, 
with a violent wind chill to match. My windows had shattered. I was bleeding. I only had one spare tyre. Not that a new tyre would have done me any good anyway. My car had folded up along the edge of the bridge like it had been made of paper mache. Aside from some general soreness and a cut across my chest, I was okay. I pulled my jacket and gloves from the wreck as I stood by. I searched the car from my phone, to no avail of course. It had been resting on the dashboard. No phone, no car, and ten miles from the nearest town. I was left alone with the miasma that was creeping back into my conscious mind as the trauma of the wreck left the forefront of it. There was no moon in the sky. The only light available to me was coming from my tail lights. Faced with little in the way of options, I pulled some road flares from the trunk and I placed them around the wreck. I used the last flare and some kindling gathered from the edge of the woods to build a fire. It wasn't much, but it was just good enough to keep me warm. It also helped to keep the smell at bay. For a while. At some point, I fell asleep next to my makeshift campfire. I woke to the soft sound of my phone ringing. As I slept under my leather trench coat, it had snowed. The white flakes were still falling as I startled awake. The fire had been reduced to glowing embers that sizzled as the snowflakes landed on them. I was chilled to the bone. Even still, I shot to my feet and I wrapped myself in the trench coat as I marched towards the sound of my ringing phone. In the deep blue light of morning, I could see the white light of my phone glistening along the banks of the creek below the bridge. I stumbled towards it. I pulled the small device into my hands. Of course, it had stopped ringing. The screen had cracked, and my fingers were all but too numb to work the small touchscreen. I pressed the emergency call button and I fell to my knees shouting as I watched a notification scroll across the top of the screen. No service. Kneeling at the bank of the creek, I looked up to see a terrible sight before me. Not one, not three, but thirteen bodies hanging from the bottom of the bridge, all in various states of decay. Each one had been hanged by a noose and left to rot. Some of them looked as if they had been there for months. A gentle wind blew under the bridge that caused the bodies to sway slightly. One by one, their eyes began to open. Desiccated arms reached towards me and began clawing at the ropes that bound them in place. I tried to stand and stumble backwards. My phone flew from my hand and shot into the water. I crawled on my hands and knees towards the road before gaining some footing and shooting up the bank towards my car. The scent was carried by the wind. The cold air had lessened it slightly. But, now that I knew I was breathing the particles of death and decay that escaped the macabre scene, it sickened me to my core. A green sign next to the bridge read, Koga Creek. I heard the rumble of an engine in the distance. Slowly, the yellow headlights came around the bend. It was a beat-up old Chevy pickup. 
it slowed down as it approached the crash site, and an elderly man in a karate jacket rolled down his passenger window and said, You're gonna catch a death if you stay out here, son. Need a ride? Of course, I climbed into the truck as quickly as I could and closed the door. Thank you. Very much. You just saved my life. I heard the distinct sound of a hammer being pulled back on a revolver. The old man smiled a toothless grin. He laughed as he said, Now, I wouldn't take it that far, son. You didn't happen to go under that bridge now, did you? The look of fear in my eyes said it all. He smirked and said, Show me your hand, boy. I extended my hand. It was still pale and red from the cold. With the swiftness of a much younger man, he pulled a knife and he slashed it across my hand in one fluid motion. I pulled my hand back and he said, Show me your hand, boy. He looked down at his gun and then back up at me. I extended my hand again and he pushed the hammer back on the gun. My hand was bleeding profusely. He handed me a handkerchief and said, Sorry son, had to make sure. The dead ones don't bleed. I shot back, what the hell are you talking about? He put the truck into gear and slowly pulled away. As we were moving down the road, he said, My boy put those things down there. Only place we could think to put them. Otherwise, they just wander around. I stared at the windshield, and I asked, What are they? The old man simply said, Oh, I don't suppose anyone knows. My granddad told me stories about the dead of Koga Creek. I guess they've always been like that. As we moved further away from the bridge, the stench began to dissipate. The old man took me into town, and from there, I was able to get to a hospital. Later that day, a tow truck would arrive to fetch my car. I had mentioned the bodies to the police. An officer would later tell me that they had recovered seven bodies from below the bridge at Koga Creek. About six years ago, I started having migraines. It began as just a bad headache, but it grew increasingly worse over time. Sometimes, I would start waking up in the middle of the night, my head pounding so bad it made my neck twitch. I would just lie there, bobbing my head to the beat of the pain. It would come about once every two or three months, but it would incapacitate me completely. Sometimes, my vision got too blurry to work. Other days, I could do nothing but vomit. Once, my hearing was impaired for several days. The pounding in my head just got so loud that I could actually hear it. I tried everything. First, I thought it was just dehydration. I started to drink a bottle of water every day, just in case. The headache still came back. This time, it was so strong that it actually woke me up several times a night. At that point, I cut out caffeine. For two months, I didn't even have a Fanta. Not the slightest hint 
of caffeine. The headache came back anyway, so the problem was neither caffeine nor dehydration. I tried several other things, regular exercise, a better pillow, cutting out sugar, massage, documenting my sleep cycles. Nothing worked. As I started having more regular headaches, I lost about 10 pounds, just from loss of appetite. Sure, I could use the weight loss, but it was getting ridiculous. About four years ago, I talked to my dad about it. Apparently, violent headaches run in the family. He's a regular tough guy who wouldn't go to the hospital for no less than a stroke or a broken bone. So he never really thought about it. He just recommended me some over-the-counter migraine pills, lots of sleep, and trying not to think about it. I took his advice. About a year ago, just before the lockdown, I was at a party. One of the other guests happened to be a doctor. She mentioned having a headache earlier that day and not being sure if she should have gone to the party at all. So I mentioned my own experience with headaches. The more I explained my symptoms, the more she just looked at me. She seemed confused. It might be tension related, but no, that doesn't make sense, she said. You should probably check that out. So I did. I live in a town that fortunately has a very good hospital, one of the best in the country. I explained my symptoms to a nurse and got to speak to a doctor shortly thereafter. I had brought along my notebook, showing that I had tried pretty much everything I could think of, and the doctor agreed that we should take it seriously. I got a remission to a specialist at the neurology department two weeks later, and I was told to keep taking notes. They were especially curious about my pain levels. When I finally met with the doctor, Kenneth, I was nervous as hell. I'd been keeping this quiet from my family and friends, not wanting to worry anyone. But when you're there, standing next to a medical professional that thinks something might be seriously wrong with you, you want someone there with you. I'm a grown ass man, but I would have loved to have my mum there. I was put through several tests. I had to fill out several health declaration forms, then test blood, urine, and get an ECG. It was over pretty quickly, and Dr. Kenneth promised to keep in touch. It took eight days, and those were some of the longest days of my life. Of course, it all turned out to be nothing. I had surprisingly good blood values, no heart problems, and no substance irregularities. There was a slight suspicion of lead poisoning. I had to come in for more tests. I went back, and we sat down in Kenneth's office. He seemed uncomfortable. He told me he would be prescribing a more powerful migraine medication. It came in syringe form, but that he wanted to run a scan on me first to eliminate worst case scenarios. So I had a CAT scan. I kind of blacked out. I don't remember anything about it, apart from a feeling of unease. A few days later, he called me back. I had to come in for a second CAT scan. I was really weirded out about this. Apparently, the first test was inconclusive. They ran another scan, 
and I had to lie in a different position this time. I didn't even have to go home afterwards. I just had to wait a few hours. I sat in the waiting room, trying to figure out how to tell my parents that I might have a serious brain condition. I had the bullet points written on the back of a receipt. Then, I got called back to Kenneth's office. He seemed frustrated as he closed the door behind me. I don't know what to tell you, he said. We thought it was a reading error at first. Then he showed me the pictures. At the very front of my forehead, there's a shade obscuring parts of my brain. At first it looked like a tumour. It scared me senseless. It's not a tumour, he explained. I'm not entirely sure what it is. He then showed me the second set of pictures. Now, it is clearer as I lay on my side. It is not a tumour, but it kind of looked like a cloud on the front of my forehead. Some kind of disturbance. I've never seen this, but looking at it, it made me realise the issue is not part of your brain, but the front part of your cranium. Look at this again. I took another look at the first picture. At the very front of my forehead, if you look closely, there was a pattern. Small circles. Some full, some empty, some half full. Geometric lines, all contained within a square, about three inches across. It didn't look organic. It's metallic, Kenneth explained. At first, I thought it was some sort of cyst just under the skin, but it's not that simple. It's not entirely iron either, as it didn't react to the scan. He tapped the side of his head. It's on the inside of your cranium, sort of like an iron tattoo on the inside of your skull. Of course, there was no explanation. How the hell do you even explain something like that? Ever since I got the results, I've been doing collation therapy. Even though the tattoo isn't completely iron, it gave me the same side effects as that of heavy iron poisoning. Collation therapy really, really helps, even though the side effects are bullshit. I don't really get those migraines anymore. I still get sensations in my head, but they're no longer headaches. I can feel a warmth from my forehead at times. It can be so strong and so precise that once I actually managed to draw the lines and patterns from tracing my fingers across my head. It is hard to explain what that looks like. Sort of like a circuit board, but made of worms. I still have regular checkups with Dr. Kenneth, but there seems to be no more that can be done. As my symptoms have evened out, there is little reason left for me to come in. I just have to live with it. It just isn't worth the risk of invasive brain surgery even though it might be an option in the future. It is so weird living with this. I can feel it. And as soon as I start to think about it, I just feel it more. I get this awful, claustrophobic feeling, and I've started to get panic attacks. Whenever there's sunlight directly on my face, that small part of my head gets warm very fast. I no longer have headaches, but I sometimes feel very, very weird sensations. Last week, I woke up in the middle of the night 
trying to scratch something that felt like a phantom limb coming out of my head. It was like there was supposed to be something there. I don't even want to start thinking about where it came from or what it means. I know it is there and no matter what I do, it'll stay there. I sometimes smack my head with my hand as if to realign my head, but I don't think it does anything. I don't know what this is, and I don't know if I can live with it. Even if I can, I don't know if I want to. I used to work at a marketing firm. It was a small company, but large enough that we operated on an entire floor of the building we rented, and that I was not familiar with everyone else who worked there. I started in 2007 as part of their web-based media team. For those of you who don't know anything about the marketing business, it's very client-driven. A team of producers sell our services to companies, often a little overzealously, and the designers and developers typically have to work like slaves to meet the producers' promises. This can mean late nights, taking a cab home because the commuter rail is shut down. It also means coming in on weekends and working late then too. It was November of 2008, and we had a big promotional site being developed for a rather important client. I'm not at liberty to give out details surrounding the project, but it's not relevant to the story anyways. What is relevant is that the client was pushy, as most are, and the site was complex. So, I ended up having to come in on a Saturday and work late into the evening to make sure we'd have something ready to present by Monday. If you've ever worked in an office on the weekend, you know how different and isolated it can feel. There were other people at first, ambitious or merely driven, doing their thing, but never our paths did cross. The office was organized in patches of cubicles. We developers tend to be a little off-kilter, goofy, prone to coming in wearing t-shirts and faded jeans. The higher-ups put us in the back corner so that tours with potential clients could avoid having to explain us and our appearance to them. The corner just happened to be facing the alleyway between our building and the next one. The back row of cubicles eventually got replaced with an aesthetically pleasing row of glassed-in offices for the director of the web-based media team and some selected subordinates. But at the time of this tale, there was only her dark office and a row of grungy cubicles where said subordinates vied for legroom with piping and windows looking out the brick facade of the adjoining structure. The lighting in our section, it was often dim. My co-workers liked to loosen any fluorescence that flickered rather than request a change of bulb. My own cubicle was on the far side of the area from the beautiful brick vista, smack dab in a corner with a set of shelves. I only warranted half the space of a regular cubicle because I was the newest member of the team. Seated at my computer, a radiator warming my toes and my back to the rest of the office, I worked on the site. 
It was a bit after midday when the producer called me to check on the status of the project. The nice producers came in and stuck around to show their support when you had to come in on weekends. Sometimes they'd go pick up lunch or dinner to reduce your downtime. The not so nice ones called and encouraged you while they went off shopping or played golf. Things were going well and I told her as much. While she began droning on about a list of features I should remember to have implemented, I heard a noise behind me. It sounded like chains rattling, which I thought was an unusual sound for someone to be making, which is why I got up after finishing the conversation and hanging up and went into the kitchen area to investigate. The kitchen separated our section from the graphic designer group and it was at the end of a large open hall that had several meeting rooms attached before ending on the other side of the lobby with the front desk and elevator. There was an old freight elevator right by the kitchen side of the hall but we usually avoided using it because of its tendency to break down. There was nobody in the kitchen but as I turned to look down the hall toward the front desk, I saw the door to the freight elevator coming to a close. At the same moment it closed completely, I spotted a co-worker heading for the lobby elevator. They turned at the sound of the freight elevator door shutting, saw me, and waved. Don't forget to turn on the security alarm before you leave, he said. Am I the last one here? I asked. He nodded and headed for the elevator. When I got back to my desk, the phone was off the hook. I chalked it up at the time to me being forgetful, but I wonder now if it was something else. The line was making that weird noise you hear when you've left it off the hook for too long. So I hung it up and went back to my work. It was getting dark out, and I still wasn't done. So I called my wife to tell her I would be working late and to go ahead and eat dinner without me. As I hung up the phone, I heard a creaking sound, like door hinges. I was feeling a bit creeped out, being all alone. So I got up and went back to the kitchen area to see if someone had come in. If they had, and I left before them, I wouldn't want to activate the alarm. Between the cubicles in the kitchen is a very tight hallway, which is where the restrooms are found. As I passed it, I saw the men's room door coming to a close, like... I had just missed someone going in. I waited in that spot for about five minutes, trying to look nonchalant about standing around, like I was just trying to do something instead of just watching to see if this person came back out. Finally, feeling increasingly anxious, I walked down the dark hall and slowly opened the men's room door with the planned excuse of what the hell, I had to go and this is a bathroom. The bathroom wasn't just empty, it was pitch black. The lights had been out since I came in that morning and nobody had turned them on. Walking into pitch black darkness unexpectedly like that can really put you in a state, let me tell you. Suddenly being blind when you were able to see just a moment ago, it was like the air got sucked out of me. And I realized I was holding my breath because everything was dead silent and my ears had sensitized in the hopes of catching even the slightest sound. I stood there for a second and then turned on my heel and got out of the restroom back into the hallway where 
I clutched the wall like I was afraid it was going to fall away, leaving me back in that infinite blackness. I wasn't even thinking about whether anyone else was watching me at that point. I couldn't tell you why I was scared at the time. I just was. I did not like being alone in that office. I knew that right outside was a brightly lit city, but somehow it all seemed really far away. The tea station was a block away. I could run to it and be home in a couple of hours, but then I'd have to explain to the producer that I wasn't finished the site because I got scared, and she was sure to tell everyone else. I'd be laughed out of the office. I flipped on the light switch to the restroom. The men's room, it was about the size of two of our cubicles, and even grungier than the alley behind the office. There were two stalls, a pair of urinals, and a trio of sinks with a wall-length mirror. I hated the urinals because one was right by the door, and I felt like people passing by could see in while I went. The other one was made for a midget. Even though I was alone, I went and sat down in the stall. I also just felt the need to sit and relax a moment. I was just beginning to relax when I heard the door creak again, followed by footsteps on the tiles. I was relieved by the sound because it meant I wasn't alone. Someone else had come in, and all that sudden fear was just me being irrational. I cleared my throat, a tradition I do, to kind of say, this stall is occupied. The moment I made the sound, the footsteps stopped. Suddenly, I felt a bit anxious again. I cleared my throat a little less obviously to make it seem less like an introduction and more like I had just had a bit of congestion. The footsteps suddenly began to get closer. When it sounded like they were right outside my stall, they came to a stop. I got very tense now and I leaned down to look at the person's shoes. There weren't any. At that moment, I got goosebumps on my arms and my heart rose up into my throat. My stomach was doing cartwheels, but I went about the routine of finishing up, flushing and opening the stall door. The room was empty. I went over to the sink and I began washing my hands, constantly looking over my shoulder and around the room in the mirror. I went to the hand dryer and I started it up and was rubbing my hands together when I heard another sound right behind me. I could see in the reflective chrome of the dryer nozzle, the other stall door was shut where before it had been wide open. At that point, I didn't care whether my hands were wet or not. I wiped them on my pants and turned for the door out of the room. The whole space felt smaller, more confined, and as I walked past the stalls, I heard the click of the lock and the stall door started swinging open as if to greet me. I didn't look in. I didn't want to see, even if there was somebody there. I just ran the last few feet, yanked that door open as hard as I could, and bolted down the dark hall, back to the safety of my computer. When I got back to my desk, my phone was off the hook again. I could hear someone speaking, even before I picked it up. I put it to my ear, and listened. At the tone, 
it will be 7.43. I held the phone there, listening for the mentioned tone. I turned and watched the hallway. I couldn't see down it. There were no other sounds except for the hiss of the radiator and the computer fan. The recorded voice played again, but this time it was different. It sounded like one of those old cassette tape players when you only held the play button halfway down. It was deeper and slower, and I did not feel any comfort in it anymore. At the tone, it will be 7.43. I hung up. At that point, I decided that I did not want to be there anymore, and I didn't care if I got laughed at later for it. I grabbed my satchel and saved my work. Just as I told Windows to shut down, the phone rang. Instinctively, I picked it up, figuring it was just the producer calling. I'd just tell her I'd come in tomorrow and finish it. That's what I'd do. At the tone, it will be 7.45, said the voice. I hung up and I pulled the cord out. The phone at the desk next to mine rang. I ignored it and I grabbed my shit to get the hell out of there. I decided as I walked that my best course of action was to go into the kitchen walk the long hallway to the front desk and just wait for the elevator. Then I remembered that I had to set the alarm. The alarm pad was past the elevator, around a corner, back by the executive offices. Not a big problem, I thought. As I walked past the dark hall towards the kitchen, I looked down it, just to make myself feel better. The door to the men's room was wide open. Worse, it was pitch black inside again. But I realised as I stopped and looked that I had never turned it off. The linchpin in my horror came when the door suddenly began to slowly shut, as if It had been waiting for me as an audience before doing so. I turned away and went into the kitchen, trying not to think about the fact that the men's room was just on the other side of the wall from the hallway. I looked down the hall at the front desk and the elevator out of there, and it never seemed so far away before. I took a step, and from behind came another sound that sent shivers down my spine. The crash bar on the fire escape being pushed. I spun a 180. The fire escape was located right next to the director's office, and was just about two rows of cubicles away from the kitchen area. As I watched, The door to the fire stairs down the back of the building swung slowly open into darkness. I turned back towards the hall and ran. The sound of a ding indicated the arrival of the freight elevator, and as I passed it, its doors slowly began to open, just like the stall door in the bathroom. I heard the sound of rattling chains from inside but I did not look. I was running, running for that front desk, running for the elevator down to the lobby. When I got there, I slammed into the wall between the elevator doors and punched at the down button desperately. I turned back to look where I came from. Every time I do, I think of Lot's wife in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You never look back ever. The back area of the office was bathed in blackness. I could not see it at all. 
There was some light coming into the kitchen from the developer area, but even as I stood there watching, it seemed to fade and become dark. I looked at the elevator floor indicator and I prayed that the approaching car was brightly lit. Two. Three. Four. The ding of its arrival was beautiful. The doors opened to a well-lit salvation. I scrambled in and I frantically hammered at the ground floor button. As the doors slowly started closing, I watched the encroaching darkness seem to swallow the office. When the car reached the ground floor, I was squashed down into the corner, terrified that it would at any moment fill the compartment and eat me. I bolted through the lobby and out onto the street where I promptly threw up, grossing out a passing cyclist who yelled words of encouragement as he continued down the street. I did not return to the office the next day. I told the producer that I had become violently sick and she talked the client into extending the deadline. I got chastised for forgetting to set the alarm, but no harm was done. Three months later, they reorganized the back area of the office, built the subordinates' offices, tore down a wall between our section and the kitchen, and set the cubicles up in a more standard format moving me from my little corner by the dark hallway. I never went down that hallway again. In the remaining year that I was there, if I had to go, I walked down to the front desk and I took the elevator down a floor where there was a public access restroom. Much bigger. Much cleaner. Much brighter. And far less haunted. Haunted.